Welcome to We Talk is the second installment of what is a traveling talk show and live event that we've founded in partnership with Dell, who are just great partners to women and yeah. to creators everywhere. Um, and I can't thank them enough. I had this idea at Sundance. I was on a panel at Dell, and I thought, how can we change this? Not that Me Too is Me Too is very important, but how can we sort of shift it to We Do and evolve? The conversation to looking at all of the incredible women that are shaping our culture and making change that needs to happen because um, it's a great opportunity for change. I used to do BYOD, Bring Your Own Doc, about documentaries. And, um, and in light of that, I decided to anchor every panel here at Tribeca uh, during the Tribeca Film Festival with a woman-directed film that is at the festival and sort of bring together people that I felt um, are doing incredible things in, in the world. Uh, who could also speak to the theme of that film. And in this case, uh, we have Stephanie Wongrail and her film, Blowing Up. And, uh, and Eliza, you are actually in the film. Mm -hmm. So we have a, we're lucky enough to have Eliza Hook, the subject of the film, here from Austin, Texas. And you're going to see a clip. I hope we added it. We did, right? Did we get a clip? Um, I think so. Okay, good. So let's just talk about, let, let me introduce everybody first. Um, and thank you to Dell. Oh, I also forgot to thank the Roxy Cinema Hotel. Um, this place, yeah. this venue has been uh, uh, really a home and a haven to me. Okay, so Stephanie is an award-winning filmmaker and a commercial director. She's directed three feature-length films. The first is, here we go again. Yeah. Whoa, I need mommy. I love you, mommy. Yes, whoa, well, I need. Okay, at least it's... <laughs> It's phonetic. Yes. So that's good. Um, nominated for an Emmy and was the recipient of three Grand Jury Prize Best Documentary Awards at AFI Silver Docs, which is a great festival, the Asian American International Film Festival, and the San Francisco International Asian American Film Festival, as well as a 2011 Cine Special Jury Award. Her second film, Tough Love, premiered at Full Frame Documentary Festival in 2014 and went on to screen in our nation's capital for a White House policy discussion around parents and the foster care system. Really important work. And this third film, Blowing Up, blew my mind. It premieres here at the Tribeca. Did you already premiere? Yes. It premiered here at the Tribeca Film Festival. I hope that went well. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, very important film that looks at sex work and prostitution and human trafficking through the lens of our nation's first human trafficking intervention court in Queens, New York. When a woman leaves her pimp, it's called blowing up. Um, so uh, the film tells the story of a compassionate judge, a 53-year-old woman who just it lights up the screen with her humanity. Um, and, and together with Eliza and other people at GEMS, this special program, um, really makes it a place that people can feel safe for a time until ICE invades, right? Um, it seems. So let's take a look. Actually, before we do anything else, let's just take a look at a, a clip from the film. I'm going to ask for an outright dismissal today. I don't know that they'll give it, but worth trying. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. That's why we're here today. Did, did you bring anything? You, so you have no proof. I told you yes. Bring all. I told you to bring all proof of everything. So they came in. Um, they they asked for massage, and then uh, they asked us if we have a massage license, and then I said no. Are you applying for asylum right now? Okay, and at what stage are you at? I think in the original court date, you were so frazzled and upset that a lot of information just got lost in the in the craziness of like court, and so it's no problem. I just this next leg and hopefully the last leg of this court process, I just really need to be able to get a hold of you so I can tell you what's going on. Okay, so what's going to happen today is you're going to have three separate choices. 
You can plead not guilty, you can go to trial, and you can fight the charges. That's one. The second option is you can plead guilty to a disorderly conduct, which is a violation and doesn't give you a criminal record. The third option is you can participate in a program where you would be five sessions of a program. At the end of the program, your case would be dismissed in six months. Now, something really, really important, just don't even work at massage parlors, don't go to them, because the police are cracking down all over Queens, arresting as many people as they can. Whether, sorry. All right, and there's people who just work at the counter and they get arrested. And then they say that there's prostitution involved every single time. So you've got to be so careful. Yeah. Eliza Hook, we've just seen in action um, mm. doing this work that you grew to love as part of this program. And then um, Stephanie does a really sensitive job of showing you having to leave the program. Mm. Which mm. I was sad for all the women that wouldn't get to meet you again. Mm. Can you tell us about what that work is like and what that what GEMS is and what, what, you know, how you form those bonds. So, I mean, it seemed like you knew them really well. Yes. Yeah. Um, GEM stands for Girls Educational Mentoring Services, and we provided holistic services uh, for girls and young women who had been commercially sexually exploited or domestically trafficked, um, and or if they were in the life, halfway in, halfway out, out, whatever stage they were at, we met them where they were at. Um, I ran the criminal court advocacy program. Um, I started out in a safe house first and then moved on to managing the criminal court advocacy program. And uh, the young women that I served were really like my children. I mean, I was with some of them for years and years and years, and I still am in contact with many of them. Um, it's about consistency and relationship and uh, trying to create options for them, whatever that looks like for them. Often people ask me, well, what successes have you had? Success looks very different for everyone. Um, it's a relative statement. It's an individual process. So young, one young woman making it on time to five sessions is a huge success for her and will help her be able to get a job so she can show up on time to that job. Or another young woman I have who I've known for since she was 17 uh, is now in uh, school to be a doctor. Wow. So it's it's... I don't even have the time to explain what that process was like. It was very difficult work. Most people, on average, lasted about one to three years in my position, and I was there for eight. And so I am currently in a respite um, because I showed up every day very clear on why I was showing up. And as I discussed earlier with my new friend, um, once you start to question why you're showing up or don't have the ability to check your, your stuff at the door, um, then you should maybe take a step back and not show up for a little while. Um, so who knows what the future holds? I may step back into it, but for now I'm taking a long break to heal. So. And what are you doing now? Oh, I'm a concrete mason now. Wow. Um, <laughs> I have my own concrete company awesome. for now. Cool. Yeah. Incredible. Um, Stephanie, what, what, what are the numbers like? And it seems like it's a lot of immigrants. It seems like it's a lot of people who are you know, already struggling just to make ends meet and maybe don't even know what they're getting into. Yeah, so I'm, it's, it was one thing that, you know, I was so um, touched by when I first walked into that courtroom for the very first time when I was doing my observation and research of the space. I was just, you know, half of the courtroom was these undocumented Asian women who were aged between like 40 to 63. You know, like, just like not what you would expect for, you know, a courtroom of women who've been arrested for prostitution. So, um, and the numbers the, of undocumented women who were being targeted had just gone up tremendously. I think there was an Urban Justice Institute report that was published recently where, like, over the span of, like, maybe a year or two years, I can't remember, the uh, um, arrests went up by 2,700 percent. It was just, like, ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So it was obviously... Um, profiling going on within these low, vulnerable communities of uh, women who don't speak English, who have undocumented status. Um, so th there was just something interesting there to explore. 
especially since my parents are immigrants to this country, and I speak Mandarin so I can communicate with them and talk to them. Actually, the first time that I walked into the court, one female defendant came up to me and asked me, what are we doing here in Chinese? And I said, I don't know. Let me help you find your lawyer so she can help explain what's going on and why you're here. And a lot of it's about getting them to show up. And, uh, and, and really, I see you trying to incentivize them and reward them for showing up. Um, and so it really takes a turn when ICE shows up, too, and starts using that. But it seems that the prostitutes are charged much more frequently than the pimps. Mm -hmm. Or the Johns. Or the Johns, oh, yeah, Johns. absolutely. Um, we'll come back to that. Okay. I want to introduce Heather Hunter, absolutely. who is a photographer. Um, a great photographer. Maybe we can look at some of the work. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. Beautiful. Also, a long. You might know her as an icon, long celebrated in front of the lens, um, and in adult entertainment, um, and also just a celebrated pop icon, the subject of so many songs, and uh, just yeah. I mean, just <laughs> all, all around superstar Heather Hunter, but. Um, but what you might not know about Heather that I only learned recently is that <laughs> she grew up with all of that in her face in the first 10 years of her life. Yes. Right there on the streets. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I wanted to bring her onto this panel to really talk about it in a first person sort of way. And, um, and since we didn't get to speak with you earlier, I, I would love to know how all of that impacted uh, the empowering images that we see here as well. Um, well, first I want to start off with, I'm, I'm so happy to be here. Mm -hmm. Just to honestly, this is a really good experience for me. It's a pleasure. Um, I, I can say, um, first I'll, I'll explain my history. Uh, I think um, when I was a little bit younger, I think about five years old, I experienced one of my family members, I was, explode, I was exposed to prostitution. So um, I was, you know, you you hang out with your family member. Well, I would say my sister, my oldest sister. And I would, she was actually, fell in love with a pimp and she wound up being a prostitute on the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, so at an early age, I was exposed visually to the violence on the streets, her hooking, um, to her pimp being very, very physically abusive. And I, I looked at that lifestyle where I was like, okay, you look at your older sister, you look at them to be a role model, but you, you want to do stuff that is going to be not like them, but better, especially if they're taking the wrong direction in life. And um, I looked at my sister and I was like, okay, I want to I wanna be greater than my sister, but I don't want to have a man control me the way that I would see her being controlled on the streets and um, as she was prostituting. So I kind of took control of my life. And by the time I got into the streets and um, I had my first experience when it came to sexuality, I was sexually assaulted. Um, that's how I lost my virginity. Um, and instead of being victimized, because I was victimized, I, I did not want to be a victim. So I, at a very young age, at my age 16, 17 years old, I took control of my sexuality in every way, whether it was physical, Visually, I just really wanted to control what sexuality was all about. And that journey took me into the adult industry. Um, and even with the adult industry, I kind of controlled everything that I was in. I was also an adult dancer, a stripper. I controlled that environment because I, I, I found myself to be able to control men in a very intimidating way to have power over them in a sexual manner so I would not be hurt in any way. Yeah. Um, and when I came down to forgiveness, uh, the person who sexually assaulted me, um, you have to have forgiveness, because you're right, you cannot move on with your life. You can't have closure. Um, and I literally forgive them, because I, I found logic in an understanding on how that person felt, because that person was abused as well. So with that, Enlightenment, I think, at a very early age. It took me into the journey of the adult industry. I had some forms of dealing, as, dealing with prostitution, helping a lot of girls in the industry, showing them different ways how they can do other things without selling their body. 
You know, um, there's a way, there's so many ways you can express yourself sexually. And I, I noticed with the women on the streets, they did not want to stop prostituting. Any woman that I met, it was, it's, a, it was, it's like addiction. You're very addicted to that world. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's something that it's so hard to leave. But if you give them another platform that's still expressing themselves in a sexual manner, they're willing to walk through that door. And everything that I've ever created in my life, I, I, I meet men and women with broken wings that come from the sexual industry. And I help them along the way. And I show them other avenues on how to express themselves. So when it comes down to my photography, a lot of these women um, come from dancers. Um, they're never portrayed in this manner because they can never get someone to photograph them in a high fashion way. So I really take girls from my business and I show them another way. And it helps them. It helps them achieve to where they want to be. And these two models, this is Geneva and this is Jan. And right now, they're actually working in the fashion industry right now. Wow. Yes. They're working, yeah. They're actually, um, Jan is actually, um, she's an actress now. She's doing films. And Geneva, she's actually a fa fashion stylist and she models on the side now. So it's, it's a beautiful thing to go from the adult industry and to go behind the lens and really portray the women that they, the way they want to be portrayed. You know, and not take advantage of them, and give them a different opportunity in life. And you told me that you've wanted to be involved in gems yeah, for a long time. Yeah, because I, it's, it's a, but we're kind of scared, yes, a little bit reticent. Very yeah. much because um, 14 years ago I saw a documentary on gems, and I was inspired by that. But from someone who came from my industry, you know, I had, I was very apprehensive because I'm not sure where do I fit in. Am I going to be a solution? You know, for something that I kind of was a part of the problem, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, I kind of scared off of it, but when I saw your, your film, it, it was amazing to see what GEMS have done in the past 14 years. I mean, to build a court system, to, 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 protect, these, uh, to protect the sex workers, it's amazing, you know? Because I, I, I know so many men and women that are out on the street and they hustle and they sell their body and there's no one out there caring for them. Mm -hmm. And no matter how much you give them a platform, their mind is so conditioned to the addiction, mm -hmm. you know, and to the pain that they experience throughout life. Mm -hmm. You know, so kudos to you. That was that was an incredible film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. yeah. I, um, I think we have another clip. Do we have a second clip of the film? <laughs> Well, I'll see. I'll see if Whitney can pull some magic. Okay, cool. While we keep talking, but I want to introduce my sister, right there in the center. Uh, Rabbi Rachel Timoner is an activist who I invited onto this panel for a number of reasons, but I felt like she really could talk about re redemption and renewal and having a second chance and where that falls in uh, spirituality. Um, Rachel herself is. For those of you who were not here earlier and did not see the other episode that Rachel was on, I can't get enough of her. Um, <laughs> she's launched several community organizing and social justice initiatives at CBE, which is uh, the temple that she now presides over. I don't know, how, that's probably not the right term. Serves. Serves. Much better. I like that better. Okay. Uh, including dismantling racism, uh, a dismantling racism community organizing team and in partnership with New York City Council Member Brad Lander, uh, hashtag Get Organized BK, through which thousands of New Yorkers work together to defend democracy and human dignity after Trump's election in 2016. Um, there's Rachel being arrested um, <laughs> with 19 <laughs> other rabbis and the largest wow. group of rabbis ever arrested in, in our history, mm -hmm. isn't it? No, no? It, no, it turns out no, no. Oh wow, that was like the rumor for a while. Yeah, it was a rumor for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe mom spread that when she called me all excited. <laughs> I don't know. Possible. I was like, why are you excited that Rachel's been arrested? <laughs> she was so proud. Um, uh, but you were. Uh, there's another. Do we have another shot? Rachel's sitting in. There's a third shot of them sitting down. They're blocking the street. There it is. Blocking the street. Rachel, what's going on there? Well, this was right after the Muslim ban 
um, was announced, and we felt like as rabbis it was important for us to stand up um, to say that uh, we, we stand with our Muslim sisters and brothers, and uh, as Jews, we know what it's like to be the other. We know what it's like to be targeted and persecuted because we're seen as different or threatening in some way. Um, and we wanted to make it very clear. We're in front of the Trump Hotel here, and we wanted to make it very clear that as rabbis, we oppose <coughs> um, the marginalization, the um, scapegoating of people just because, um, just because they're seen as different. <coughs> so that's what this was. This was us uh, putting our bodies uh, in the street to say we stand uh, together as Jews for human rights for all people. Yeah. Um, and then there's another photo, which is, in the, I believe it's in the rotunda. Yeah, in the in D.C. That was for the Dreamers. That was, we were trying to support the Dreamers uh, in their effort to have DACA be extended and to be protected for their right to live here. They've grown up here their whole lives. They're part of our country, um, and like the Muslim ban, the the um, attack on DACA is just an attempt for um, Donald Trump and Republicans to gain power at the expense of whoever they think is weak in our society and that they can target and, and grow hate against as a way of um, building up their own base. Um, so we, we went as, as Jews and rabbis to go uh, sit with the dreamers who were there trying to fight for their right to be in this country. And, um, and we're singing. We do a lot of singing, so. Yeah, so you're singing, yeah. and, and that actually gains you your freedom. But this is a good um, tip for everybody if you're arrested. Yeah, in Can the previous can... arrest, uh, we, we were being held in jail, and it was like the middle of the night. And we're all like rabbis, so what are we going to do? We just started singing. And, uh, and the, the, the people in the jail, like, I, I could tell on one level they were trying to keep us there for a while so that we didn't, it wasn't too light of a punishment. They wanted us to like have to be there for a while. But on the other hand, they were we were driving them completely crazy. And, and I could see them just like they're like putting their hands on their heads and just being like, oh make it stop. And they did release us and you know I found that to be a, a tip, a tip if you're ever in jail. <laughs> Singing seems to you know but a, actually more honestly, I mean we for for me to be able to for me to go to jail is not such a high risk proposition. I'm white, I'm a rabbi um, and you know, I, it's not that heroic for me to do that at all. It's just a, a way of um, using what privilege I have to stand up for for what's right. And um, so, yeah. I, but on this topic, do you want me to say something about this? Topic? I do. I, what I want, I do. I know, and I know what you're going to say because we just talked about that. <laughs> it's really different than what I think. Good. I want to be surprised. Okay, As a director, I love being surprised. <laughs> However, I want to surprise you with the fact that we do have the second Yay. clip. Yay! That's so. I lived in hotels, traveling from place to place. I was in hotels every day, every single day, for like six months straight. And then um, I had to run away. It wasn't, I, 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 it's, it's called blowing up when you leave a pimp. So I blew up and um, I went home. It's hard to do it on your own because when I did try to do it on my own, I got my room ran in. I got a um, gun put in my face multiple times. I've gotten robbed. I've gotten stabbed. It's, it's a lot of, it, that comes with a lot. Doing it by yourself. Like, that's like the only benefit to having a pimp is the fact that you have protection. You know? watch the whole film and thank you for doing the work that you have done. Um, what I wanted to say is that in, uh, in the Torah, in Judaism, it's our understanding that every human being is created in the image of God, every single one without exception, and that every human life has infinite value that cannot be measured. It says in the, in, uh, the Talmud, and anyone who saves a single life is as if they saved the entire world. And what the work that you were doing was about saving lives. And the idea, the reason that human life is, is thought to have infinite value is that every human being is meant to play a role in the world. And, um, and we don't, none of us knows what that role is, what someone else's role is, only that person can find it for themselves. 
And when people, when women or other people are being held down and um, their options are limited, whether they're trafficked or whether they're um, trying to survive and seeing their only options is it involving um, a life where they're, where, they're, where they're experiencing violence all the time, um, uh, where they're trapped and their options are limited, then we as a society are failing to, uh, to enable them to live out their purpose. And that means that we are violating God's will. Whenever we, we as a society create conditions where people cannot live out their purpose, we are violating God's will. And that is a big, important Jewish idea. And so I think that that relates to this, and that um, we, we are all obligated as people who um, influence the direction of this society, because we all do, um, to change these conditions so that every young girl and every woman has options in life and can find her own path for what, she, what gifts she has to bring to the world. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I just, please, Stephanie. Um, I just want to say something. I'm not sure if this mic works, so. Um, no, this I whole think it works, right? Yeah. Is it working? Okay, yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I need roll to... with the mic. <clears throat> sorry. Um, yeah, you guys need it. Um, so I, I just want to comment one thing. Like, one thing that I loved about this courtroom, and, you know, Eliza's here, but there are so many women in the courtroom that play a role, and that's mm -hmm. also, like, what we tried to do in the film was make a portrait of a system so that we didn't ID anyone. You know, I want everyone to identify with who they want to identify and follow who they want to follow because you're not going to identify with every woman in the film. They all come from different walks of life, different backgrounds, different classes. And what I loved about this space was this idea that I don't think that anyone was trying to save anyone in this space. Uh -huh. and, I, and for me, I think that's really important because this subject matter is mm -hmm. so loaded with who has agency, who has choice, you know, and what is the spectrum, <coughs> spectrum of choice available to these women mm -hmm. that to say that we're saving them or to say that Eliza was saving them, I think that's the last mm -hmm. thing that she would say that she was doing okay. or that the judge would say that she's doing. Okay. They're offering them options because they're in a courtroom where these women have been arrested. Do they want these women to be arrested in the first place? Do they want to be here in the first place? No. So I think that there's something we need to think about as society as well in terms of how we help women, you know, women helping women, women supporting women. What does that help and what does that support look like? Does it have to be a savior model? No. And so I just think that that's really important in terms of this, this, this space. Yeah. I'll just be quick and add one thing to that. <clears throat> um, you know, often people will say, oh my gosh, you're saving lives or whatever. Well, if you're going to say that, then you have to say that they saved my life in equal measure. Um, but really, truly, the young women that I served were truly the most remarkable, powerful human beings that I've ever known who have gone through things that you couldn't even possibly come up with in your imagination if you have lived a life of privilege even. Um, and they come in with their strength. And I come in with my strength and we added our strength together and created options and they were in complete control of that process. I was just there to add my strength to theirs. And that's it. I didn't save anybody. They created internal motivators to save themselves if that's what they chose to do. And that's it. Yeah, I want to add, um, because at least I know my experience when I, I left the life you just say, you know, mm -hmm. it, you really have to strip yourself from everything that you know. You have to really sh mm -hmm. strip your soul. Um, I really didn't have any help. Mm -hmm. I had to help myself mm -hmm. because I had realized that I just didn't want to be in that environment anymore. Mm -hmm. So when that, when that comes, like I said, it, it is like drugs. It is an addiction. It's a conditioning. So I had to go through literally a spiritual oh. withdrawal, mm -hmm. you know. I had to let go of the fast money. I called it the dirty money. Quick money. Yes, the quick money. <laughs> and to let go of that money, that was the cleansing. You know, it really was. It was letting go of everything that I know to actually re have a rebirth. How did you do that? Did you, did you, did you think, did you, did you kind of fill yourself with light and did you meditate, did you breathe? Or how did you oh, even begin to? I, I think it was a wake up call in my life. I think when I hit 21, and I, I decided to leave the adult business. Mm -hmm. I, I had enough. It was really like a, my spirit was 
calling me, it was reaching. It was begging me to, to find love in the, in the right, in I the right, like you were yeah. Jumping off into the unknown? Yeah, I, it was really you searching. You know, I think a lot, of, a, a lot of girls that get into the prostitution, it's more, you're looking for love. Mm -hmm. You're really looking for love. And, you know, the love comes from home. It's all about That's nurturing. Right. And when you're, when you are not nurtured at home, you go onto the streets and you, you try to find that love, but that love is not there. They're really, you're, you're a pawn to people's desires. Mm -hmm. So becoming a pawn, you become addicted to the artificial love and the nurturing, and then the money is connected. Mm -hmm. So now you're, you're kind of like in this fast-paced life that you can't seem to get out of, and you're not getting the love that you truly deserve. So I had to realize what my worth was, and I had to truly forget about finding love. I had to truly love myself. I had to find love within myself to stop everything I was doing, to find a different way of living. And I stripped myself from everything, literally. Um, I didn't work for like a whole year. I was just, I, the first time I was literally reaching out to friends and asking friends for support because I never would do that. I was so prideful. And you told me also that you are actually like not, I don't know if like against is the appropriate word, but you're not supportive of the adult entertainment industry. No, anymore. you know, I don't judge anybody who does um, adult films. But I don't like the way the business is run. Um, I, I'm, I'm very upset that they don't practice uh, safe sex, like condoms is not mandatory. Um, I didn't think my life was worth it to die over, to die over being exploited on camera, <laughs> you know? Um, it's, it's just not worth it. And I think, I think everyone has a wake up call, but there's, you, there has to be someone there to help you, like genuinely be there that really care about you. And it's not about what you can give them or, you know what I mean? They Absolutely. really have to care about you. And that's really the And questions. I love what she was doing for Gems because she generally showed that she really cared about these women. And, and, and Rachel, you probably speak to the fact that second chance mm -hmm. is actually, I mean, that's a fundamental right, isn't it? That we have a right to a second. Oh, you need a microphone. <laughs> Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm just speaking from the perspective of Judaism that there is a, a, the whole, the whole idea is that um, like we build our year around these high holy days, which are about the idea that everybody, everybody in all walks of life, um, has thing, have things we do that, that are not our best, and um, where we need an opportunity to have a second chance, and to have a chance to look inside of ourselves and say, you know, who can I be, and how can I turn and change to become more and more who I'm meant to be in the world. Mm. <coughs> what can we do to wrap this up? What, what can we do? Because we watched this film, and it, you know, it's not, and I go, I go to New York massage parlors, but I guess I'm going to the wrong ones or something. <laughs> no, 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 that's also very important. No, that's also very important, and I actually Where do we go? That. No, for what <laughs> At screenings, I say, you know, just when, you know, one thing that I don't, you know, there was that expose in the New York Times a year ago about the nail salons, mm -hmm. and so, you know, I stopped frequenting nail salons because I felt like I was exploiting the workers. One thing that I want to say, if you do go to an Asian massage parlor, keep going. We're their best clients. We want a massage, we pay well, and we tip. That's what yeah. they're here to do. They need to meet the bottom line at the end of the month to pay their rent, their smuggle fee, as well as any, send any money home that they can. They need to continue doing that. They don't speak English. There are not many economic opportunities available to them. So please continue. Like that's one thing that I've, I've been working with Asian community organizations about. Like I don't want to make it harder for them to be here than it already mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, uh, is it all Asian salon? I mean, is this where it, I mean, it was definitely the focus in Queens in that court. Um, but back to how we can help, and I, I, it's, it's wider spread than that, right? Oh, in terms of like, you know, how we can help in the bigger scheme? Yeah. Of things? With, the, with, with stopping it, yeah. with helping women get out of it. it, it well, those of us who can't go every day to the court and be right. Eliza. <laughs> What can we do? Um, just burn everything down and start over. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> um, well, I'd say if you're, if you're involved in the work, keep doing the work. If you can do the work, do the work. If you cannot, please donate your money to people who are doing the work. 
Mm -hmm. um, if you can get involved in an organization that are serving people um, where you are a reflection of them, do that. Um, if you want to volunteer for GEMS, you can go on the website. That's what I'm about to do. <laughs> GEMS-girls.org. And there's a whole section where you can um, basically put in an application to be a volunteer, and the volunteer coordinator will meet with you and figure out what's best and how you want that to look, and they do a significant background check on you. Um, is this court, well, the final thing, because we have to wrap up, okay. is this court going to, is this going to spread? It has like spread already. Great. Yeah. So it's in Houston, it's in okay. New Orleans, it's in Los Angeles. It also, because of the paper that the judge wrote, it's now in um, 12 different districts. Well, I know when I first started, we had one. Yeah. And we were left out of all the district attorney's offices, wow. literally left out. And within a matter of years, there was just a small handful of us who were just like pit bulls who never gave up. And through that process, Judge Lipman, uh, allowed us to have uh, intervention courts in all five boroughs and six additional counties at the time. We also were able to change a lot of policies and some criminal procedural laws. Um, and now it's sort of, and there's a motion called the 44010 motion, which is basically a vacator motion, which vacates someone's criminal record in its entirety, um, which means it never existed. Even the FBI will not know. <laughs> Um, it's completely wiped off the face of the earth. Uh, and that's spreading like wildfire across the country as well. Um, of course, the South is taking a bit more time to catch up. Uh, I currently live in the South, so at least I'm there, huh? Yeah. I, was say, <laughs> one other thing, I, like, I think that you know, housing is a huge issue in New York City oh, for yeah. all vulnerable populations, yeah. but especially for these girls. You know, yes. You need to leave your exploiter. You need to leave your pimp. You need to get out of your um, housing situation. There's nowhere for you to go. No GEMS was one of the first um, organizations that had mm -hmm. uh, shelter, but there are 13 beds. Mm -hmm. You know, so like housing is a huge issue for these girls. In order, you know, the court always says, one of the how can we help? Them when we can't offer them a place to go to yeah. to, mm -hmm. to escape. Yeah. yeah. What can we really do then? So that's where our money goes if we contribute. Absolutely. Perfect. Mm -hmm. If any of you have connections with city council or people who make decisions about housing in this city, mm -hmm. you need to push for more housing specifically for this and so. for for these trans young women. women and trans women and for the LGBTQ homeless mm -hmm. youth population. Yeah. I do wow. have, I have Which I would question. like to give a shout out to Cindy Lauper for, but um, when I was discussing with you earlier, you know, I just got back from Amsterdam. Yeah. And in Amsterdam, all the sex workers are it's it's, it's legalized. I mean, they have health insurance. Mm -hmm. They are taking well care. They um, they are just they have health insurance. They get they go to doctors. They literally mm -hmm. are considered very important to society there, you mm -hmm. know, contributing to the community, you know, to economics. But mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, my thing is like, since prostitution is never going, it's been here from the beginning of time, we have to be realistic, you know, <laughs> it's yes. not going anywhere, you know, so when is America going to wake up and understand that at least if we can't stop it, you can protect the ladies mm -hmm. and, and, and the men, you know? Can I say something really quick? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were founded by Puritans, uh -huh. and our laws are puritanical, and it doesn't matter what side of the issue you're on, whether you're a Democrat or Republican or even a Democratic Socialist, mm -hmm. chances are po prostitution in this country will never be legal. Yeah. Not ever. And I think it brings it back to something that, that Rachel said, which is this, it's this us and them thing that's got to stop. It's thinking that those people who are doing that thing are somehow different than you. But it, it would be different for you if you had been raised in different circumstances. Mm -hmm. And so it's extremely important that we all get involved in raising up uh, the least powerful among us right. if we ever want to be a dignified society. Mm -hmm. And on that note, I want to thank all of you <laughs> so much. Yay! Thank you for having us. Thank you, thank you, bravo.